Okay, first I'll let you know how the session will run today, just so you have an idea of what's going on. Uh, we have two incredible speakers joining us today, Fiorenza Micheli and uh, Fabiola Rivera Irisari, and they uh, they will share about their their work um, as marine scientists. And then we'll go, you know, like we normally do on Mondays, we'll go into breakout rooms with them. So we'll have time for those, uh, for all of our questions to be answered. Um, and if you can, I would just love to encourage you, please, to come uh, to come on camera so that our speakers can see you. And also just a reminder to add your place to your name if you haven't done that already so that they know where in the world you are. Um, we're having a very rainy day today in Puerto Rico, so um, internet connection has been kind of uh, choppy. And I know Fabiola is also, she's actually not very far away from me. Um, and uh, I know she's been having the same experience this morning. So let's just be patient with that and feel free to let us know if you missed something, if you can't hear anything. Um, and uh, yeah, and we're just gonna do our best. But Gabby, would you like to introduce our first speaker? Absolutely. Um, so again, welcome everyone. I'm grateful to be back here in this space with you all. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Fiorenza Micheli, and she is a marine ecologist and conservation biologist. And she focuses specifically on researching management and conservation of marine ecosystem. So she looks at processes, processes that shape marine communities, such as the role of parrotfish and reef, sh reef sharks in the coral reefs of the Pacific line islands. Um, and another example is the effects of ocean acidification on seagrass, rocky reef, and kelp forest communities. She also teaches in the Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford University and is co-director of the Stanford Center of Ocean Solutions. We are so excited to have you here with us today, Fiorenza, to listen to your story and to learn more about what you do. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Gabby, and thank you all for joining this session today. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening. I was looking and it looks like you're from everywhere around the world pretty much. So uh, no, thank you for uh, joining all of the different times of the, of the day. Uh, so uh, just very briefly uh, about myself and how I got to be in, at Stanford University. I grew up in Italy, uh, in Florence. I uh, spent a lot of my time in the Mediterranean Sea uh, and really got to basically fall in love with marine systems and decided to become a marine biologist. I got a fellowship to study in Australia for a year. Uh, and then I moved to the US with another fellowship to get my PhD in marine science on the East Coast of the United States. And then uh, after various postdocs, I got this current position that I have at Stanford University at Hopkins Marine Station. And I've been here for the past 20 years. And I feel really, really privileged to be able to do research and, and teach in marine science. And then uh, in the past four years, I started co-directing together with uh, Jim Leap, who is a lawyer by training, uh, Center for Ocean Solutions. And so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my research uh, in marine science uh, on coastal communities and ecosystems, but through the lens of solutions. And just let me take a second to start. I have, a, I have some slides. Okay. Let me get the slides going. And as I said, the, the ocean has been my passion pretty much for my entire life. And uh, in addition to being just beautiful and inspiring, oceans provide tons of benefits. Oxygen, they absorb uh, heat, the regular climate, they provide food, livelihoods for an estimated 10% 
of the uh, global population. So they're really, really uh, important, but also, as you know, threatened by climate change, acidification, overexploitation of resources. So the narratives around oceans have shifted from the oceans are huge and we can't possibly impact them ever to the oceans are imperiled. We're putting tremendous pressures on ocean and as a result, uh, it, their biodiversity, their function is degraded. And I think that now we're moving into another narrative, which is uh, we have to address these problems. And in fact, oceans are not only affected by all of these pressures, but because of the vast space that they occupy on Earth, they're also a really vast space for solutions and can provide solutions to many of the challenges that affect oceans, but really affect the planet and all of us. One of the benefits that ocean provide, of course, is food through fisheries production, uh, food, uh, seafood, no? food from the sea, uh, is the major source of animal protein for an estimated 3 billion people on Earth. They're the primary source of protein for one in five people on Earth and for over 50% of the populations in eight uh, densely populated countries. The production of seafood through fisheries has leveled off at around 8 billion tons per year in the 90s. And so production of seafood through white capture fisheries has not increased despite increasing effort. And what is instead increasing exponential is uh, uh, seafood production through aquaculture. Uh, however, both aquaculture and fisheries uh, are of course uh, threatened by climate change and habitat degradation and so the future of this production is really at stake for all of us. I also want to stress that seafood, as you probably all know, is not just calories, it's not just biomass, but many uh, species of um, foods that are consumed from the sea, that are consumed, uh, caught or produced from the sea in aquaculture are the superfoods that are really rich in lots of nutrients that are super important for health vitamins and minerals and omega-3 fatty acids that are really important for health, particularly for young children up to five years of age. So many countries in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, have focused on uh, seafood, not just as a commodity and source of livelihoods and food, but as nutrition. And so they've implemented policy to retain and distribute seafoods, for example, through school feeding programs. So that's really important to keep in mind because they're not necessarily replaceable with other foods that play really important roles in many nations and many communities. A lot of the narratives around food, seafood have focus on industrial actors, like large scale industrial fishing operations and large scale aquaculture. And the COVID pandemic and many of the shocks we've seen in the past two years have really highlighted the importance of actors in the seafood sectors at all scale, small scale, local scales, mid-scale mid operators, because those actors were impacted, but in some cases have really supported nutrition in communities by rapidly adapting and being able to provide food locally. So, this is a recent example, but basically globally, small scale fisheries and aquaculture are major producers of seafood. And sometimes this is sort of unappreciated and it goes under the radar. It's estimated that small scale fishers and, and aquaculture is produced about half of the global catch, importantly two thirds of what's destined to human consumption. So it's basically it feeds people rather than producing fertilizers or other products. Small, the small scale sector employs 90% of men and women in these sectors. And as I was saying, it's also a critical source of food and nutrients for local communities. So basically this sector is just too important to neglect and efforts uh, are critical to support the viability of this sector. Of course, small scale fish and aquaculture are also threatened by many of these pressures that are affecting all 
ocean ecosystem marine sectors, but they're particularly vulnerable because of some characteristics that make them especially susceptible to impacts from climate change or habitat degradation. Typically, they have limited mobility. Those small scale fisheries rely on small vessels. For example, many industrial fisheries move away and track changes in resources. If stocks are overexploited locally, they'll move to another fishing ground, but this often can happen in small scale fisheries. In many cases, there are limited resources, managing capacity, access to knowledge, not to implement uh, uh, adaptive strategies. And often these coastal uh, um, uh, sectors depend on habitats or species that are particularly vulnerable to the pressures of climate change and acidification. For example, coral reef ecosystems or ice ecosystems. The main characteristics of this sector is this really huge diversity. So in this recent paper, we basically characterized and analyzed the actors in the small scale fisheries and aquaculture sectors that span marine and freshwater systems and production, processing, and trade of seafoods. So these are some pictures of all of the different kinds of actors, men and women that produce or catch food, that prepare it, that sell it, that distribute it. And so this big diversity is often one of the reasons why the small scale sector is sometimes neglected in policies. It's just difficult to tailor intervention to this really high diversity. But this diversity is also a huge asset. And this is an asset because it allows for a flexibility, for a dynamism that actually is one of the key premises for adaptation to change. And I want to um, illustrate this adaptive capacity to a case studies of fisheries in Baja California, Mexico. And I want to start off by basically the observation, the conclusion that I've drawn from my 15 years of work with these communities, now col collaboration with this community, which is uh, that uh, often communities are not just victims of climate change, but they actually have now they're agents of change and can respond to influence their own resilience. And so I think that there's a lot that can be learned from these lessons and scaled. And I want to briefly illustrate what has happened in Baja California, and then talk very briefly about what that means for scaling these solutions more broadly. And then pass the microphone to Fabiola because I don't want to take too much time. And please, Natasha, Maybe um, at five minutes, or if I after 10, 15 minutes that I speak, if you can give me a sign to wrap things up, but just I don't want to take too much space. Uh, so uh, I'm going to thank you. So I'm going to talk about the coastal communities of the Pacific coast of, Baja, of the Baja California Peninsula in Mexico. This area is basically a desert on land and a rich marine forest super productive, highly diverse in the ocean. So these are marine ecosystems that really fuel the production and the economies in this region. Communities are exclusively dependent on the marine environment for their livelihood, mostly through fishing. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then also through ecotourism in recent years, for example, through ecotourism uh, whale watching, because there's these lagoons uh, along the coast that are the calving areas for gray whales. And so the whales go there, they have their babies, and then the fishing communities have organized to take people out, tourists out to watch the, to see the, the babies and the whales. And so this is one of the burgeoning sectors, but primarily is fishing. So these are marine forests that are made of kelps, primarily giant kelp, like macrocystis that you see here, and also smaller species of kelps to the south. And one no, on, the, on the, the human dimension of these communities are really interesting and innovative as well, because the fishing communities are, are organized in concessions, in cooperatives. 
uh, the cooperatives obtain concessions from the Mexican government for exclusive access to a suite of resources in their marine environment. So here in this map, you see these polygons that are the territories that each community has exclusive um, sort of fishing rights to. They're called territorial use rights for fishing or turfs. And this is a really important part of the story because this specific system that give exclusive rights and responsibility for the marine environment and its resources to community has enabled responses at the local scale in a way that open access systems that lack this kind of institutions are often not able to uh, devise and implement. The fisheries there um, uh, collect a range of invertebrates marine snails and lobsters, sea cucumbers, uh, urchins with hookah, with the diving that has a air supply from the boat, and also use traps and nets and other gear to collect, to uh, harvest feed fish. So these systems are you now basically all across the region, really well organized and highly dependent on their marine environments. But then in the last decade or so, they've been impacted by the marine heat waves that have affected coral reefs and many other regions around the world. These anomalously high temperatures that have resulted in the loss of vast swaths of this kelp forest. They're incredibly sensitive to high temperature. And so they were lost and with them many of the species. And then also a phenomenon that we started documented, documenting in uh, 2009, 2010 in this region, which is the occurrence of really uh, extreme and prolonged uh, low oxygen conditions in the water where animals basically cannot breathe, and that resulted in mass mortalities in these and many other areas around the world. So this phenomenon called ocean deoxygenation has manifested in a very uh, prominent, intense way in this region and has affected the fishes. So enabled by their strong institution and then through partnerships, across the cooperatives with the local NGOs, particularly Comunidad de Biodiversidad, a civil association organization in Mexico. And then we, in partnership with academic institution in Mexico and in the US, the communities have organized to uh, devise and implement solutions. This has included voluntary establishment of marine reserves, a network of near shore oceanographic monitoring and ecological monitoring of the kelp forests. You see here in these pictures, members of the communities, the fishers and also women in the communities trained as scuba divers to conduct the monitoring and uh, of the kelp forest, as well as servicing the sensor networks for the oceanographic monitoring and all sorts of other uh, intervention. So this really kind of grassroots uh, intense collaboration that has occurred in the ground. One of the key uh, elements of this is the voluntary establishment of marine reserves to allow for the recovery of the species of the populations following the mass mortality. The first marine reserves were set up in Isla Natividad in 2006, which is here basically on, uh, uh, in the middle of the region. And then other communities have also established marine reserves. This was entirely voluntary to begin with. And now three years ago, the government recognized this as fisheries refugia, they call them, refugios pesqueros. Uh, and so they basically, there's now support from the government to establish this uh, refugia. And then the uh, science, the monitoring that the communities have conducted, the, has revealed two really important uh, patterns in how climate change affects these communities that have been leveraged them for solution. The first is that not all species are impacted by the marine heat waves, hypoxia, harmful algal blooms, not the events that we've seen escalating in this region. And there are some species, one of those is spiny lobster, which is really a valuable uh, species, and also some fin fishes, for example, that appear to be more resilient. And so this has been leveraged to expand uh, and strengthen some of the fisheries and activity as alternatives to the fisheries that have collapsed. And then the second really important results that was revealed by the oceanographic network is that locally, 
in each of these cooperatives, there are some reefs or fishing grounds that appear to be less impacted by climate change. And so those provide refuges that have been used to site the marine reserves or aquaculture facility or uh, reef restoration projects because basically the success of this operation has been higher in the refugia. So this, you know, as I was mentioning, has been leveraged for uh, uh, adaptation. So the communities have invested in alternatives like mariculture, integrated aquaculture, artificial reefs and outlands of some of the affected species, and then the use of technology like phone apps to do direct sales, you know, like a marketplace that is digital and fisheries improvement projects. How am I doing on time? Do I have five more minutes or should I wrap up? I don't. Hi, Fiorenza, you have five more minutes. You're okay. Good. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, I wanted to uh, mention that, of course, uh, the ability to adapt and the willingness to invest limited resources in all these activities that I've described, the monitoring, the establishment of marine protected areas, the aquaculture facilities, is dependent on perception of risk and basically how the communities see you know, the trade-offs between investing in this versus continuing to fish, for example. So I want to very briefly mention this work that was led by Elena Finkbeiner here in the picture, where uh, basically we work with communities to conduct games or field experiments where uh, groups of fishers essentially were put in simulated settings to make decision. And the, the purpose of this was for all of us, the partners in the community and us as scientists to understand what are the conditions that promote this willingness to invest in adaptation? No, what, needs to, what, what needs to be in place for people to decide that this is the right thing to do for them? So you can imagine that uh, with the increasing environmental uncertainty, fishing communities that are not sure whether they'll be able to continue to fish or there'll be another heat waves or an hypoxic event that will take away their resources. There's at least two possible responses, two possible behavior that we might expect, that we might hypothesize. One is that this uncertainty, you don't know what's happening next, might erode cooperation. And basically one response might be uh, to just go in and fish all of the organisms before they die. So it might lead to overfishing and overexploitation and a really kind of a short term response. The second response, which is also plausible, is that actually this uncertainty may foster cooperation. For example, it might provide an, an incentive to distribute the risk and losses across different actors so that no one is kind of left behind and also to try to invest in recovery you know, in a longer term perspective. So to test these two alternatives, we conducted these games where basically you see those yellow squares, each of this that symbolizes a unit. It could be a lobster or an abalone or a fish. And basically in different rounds of the game, groups of fishers uh, that are exposed to different settings. For example, in some of the rounds, we threw a dice uh, and uh, with a certain outcome, a certain number coming out, half of the resources die from a heat wave. So we set up different settings, different scenarios, and then fishers make decision on how much of the resources they're harvesting. So this is called behavioral economic field experiments and we've applied in these communities. With this experiment, what we learned is that actually uncertainty under certain conditions fosters cooperation. And uh, it's an incentive to adapt, to implement adaptive actions. These conditions include strong institutions and access to diversity of resources. So the way there's only no, no one option, some awareness and previous exposure to environmental threats and then communication. And so the communities that have the strong institution that have mechanisms for communication, for example, periodic assemblies where the fishers make decision, that have some access to knowledge, for example, the, the, through the monitoring, 
uh, were actually disproportionately willing to invest in, in conservation, even in the face of the loss of their resources. So going from this case study to um, sort of the more kind of global uh, food systems, uh, there's a crucial need to bring small scale actors at the center of decision making. Often they don't have a representation in government. And so this is really, really not one of the crucial steps that are promoted in Mexico and elsewhere. And then there's, a, there's many milestones coming up, the UN summits that are happening this year. And then next year is actually the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. And so this is an opportunity to amplify the voice of the small scale sector and uh, uh, support their viability. So, and then finally, harnessing the diversity and dynamism of the fisheries by tailoring, by identifying the levers and tailoring solutions to the, lo the, co the local context and enable act enabling actors to deploy those solutions. So really seeing this diversity as an asset, not as an impediment. And then uh, um, I share with Natasha a paper that in really inspired me. And I don't know if you had an opportunity to read it, but uh, it really, for me, it's very helpful sometimes to move from the local context to thinking about what, what are the ingredients of solutions in general? And so that paper I thought did a really good job of identifying some of these sort of steps that are needed in implementing solution. One is raising awareness and really sharing that awareness with the critical mass of stakeholders. Creating motivation and incentives for new practices that could be through policy, it could be through markets, for example, you not know, the fisheries improvement projects or certification. And then developing the capacity. And that's best done through coalition of stakeholders, multi stakeholders coalition. So developing and maintaining the capacity to uh, act. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fiorenza. Wow. I see people clapping in the background. Um, wow, thank you for that uh, dive into the work that you've been doing and uh, for, for sharing about your work. It's really beautiful to see some of those images as well um, and actually see what it looks like to be doing this work. So um, yeah, thank you. I, uh, I think, um, what you're talking about with regards to the way that we think through solutions uh, collectively and kind of the actual practice of, of doing that uh, really connects to what Fabiola is going to be talking about as well um, when it comes to ocean solutions, but also when it comes to how we think about solutions in general. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute to introduce uh, Fabiola Rivera Irisari. Um, she has been, uh, she has also been working on ocean solutions for a very long time. Um, she's a coral ecologist and researcher based in Puerto Rico and holds a position as the executive secretary of the Society for the Marine Environment, um, which is a group that has been working to protect Puerto Rico's coral reefs from a mysterious disease that has been decimating the island's coral populations. Um, and her group is actually responsible for a recent policy declaration um, of a state of eco ecological emergency by the Puerto Rican government um, due to the effects of this disease. Um, I'm sure she'll share a little bit about that. Um, which means that now funding will actually be allocated to protecting Puerto Rico's coral reefs from this, from this disease. She's also a mentor to many marine biology students and teaches at the university level. Um, and she, I had the privilege actually of spending time with her this past Friday um, for, uh, to learn more about the work that she's been doing. And Fabiola is just a fantastic uh, educator. And I know that we're all gonna have lots of questions for her. Fiorenza, I actually see some questions have already been coming up for you in the chat as well. But I just wanna let everybody know that in terms of our questions, 
uh, we're going to go into breakouts with each of the speakers um, because we found that that format helps everybody get their questions answered when we're in the large room there's only time for just a few so we'll be doing that format in, of going into breakouts with the speakers so you know write down your questions and and keep them in mind because you're going to have a chance to actually spend time with each of these wonderful um, guests today so thank you Fabiola for joining us and we're yeah we're so excited to have you here Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha, for the lovely introduction. And thank you, Fiorenza, for your work. I am amazed. I am amazed. Thank you so much. That's so important what you're doing. OK, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Natasha, could you confirm that you can see my screen? Perfect. So I'm going to do my best <laughs> with my English. So if anyone doesn't understand uh, any word that I say or, or phrase or anything, please let me know and I can repeat. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking a little about what I do in, in my daily life. <laughs> I work with coral reefs and we're going to talk a little about threats to coral reefs and solutions that we come up, me as a scientist and my colleagues in the organization Sociedad Ambiente Marino. So as I said, Natasha, my name is Fabiola Rivera Irizarri. A little about me. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican coral reef ecologist. Uh, right now, I'm a marine scientist at the Sociedad Ambiente Marino, Marine Environment Society in English. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to coral reef uh, research and restoration conservation. Uh, I also teach in the University of Puerto Rico. I didn't get that. Could you try again? I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras campus right now. I don't know what you mean by. I'm a PhD candidate at okay. the University of Puerto Rico. Give me just a second. Okay, so I'm going to start this presentation talking a little about what are coral reefs. Coral reefs are basically large underwater structures made of calcium carbonate. And that calcium carbonate is secreted by these organisms that are called corals. So you can find a lot of different types of corals from different shapes, different colors, different sizes. We have hard corals, we have soft corals. And so the corals that construct these coral reefs are called reef building species, which are actually the hard corals, which are, which are these ones right here. These are some of the species that you can find in coral reefs. And so when you see these this corals, you can see a, a structure, right? This is the coral, this is another type of coral. But when you see these corals from uh, a closer point of view, you're gonna see these organisms, these very small organisms that are called polyps. So when you see one coral is actually a colony of these organisms called polyps. And these small, small organisms are the ones that secrete that calcium carbonate. So the construction of a coral reef is basically in the hands of these small organisms. And so where can we find these coral reefs? So in this map, every one of these red dots represent a coral reef. So you can see that basically reefs are, can be found in the tropics and subtropical areas. This is basically because uh, waters where coral inhabit have to, um, have to be salt water between 33 and 40 parts per thousand, more or less. They have to be clear waters because they are, highly, they are highly dependent on sunlight. So they need sunlight also. And temperature must be between 23 to 20, 29 degrees Celsius, uh, more or less, for the corals to survive. So they need these four basic conditions and you can get those conditions in the tropical and subtropical areas. So in my case, I work in Puerto Rico, right? So where is Puerto Rico located? We're gonna 
Puerto Rico is located in the Americas, Central America, actually. If we zoom in in this area, this is Puerto Rico. This is my island. So in Puerto Rico, we have the perfect conditions for coral reefs to grow. In this map, everything that's red represents coral. Everything that's green represents um, marine vegetation, such as seagrass. So you can see that Puerto Rico is um, surrounded island-wide with coral reefs. Maybe you can see a lot of red in the north area, but if we zoom in, you're gonna see red in all over the coastal line of Puerto Rico. But the, the most, um, the, the largest extensions of reefs are located in the south and in the east area of Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico has salt water for every five uh, parts per thousand. It has clear waters, which makes the corals uh, uh, accessible to sunlight. And the temperature is approximately 28 degrees Celsius, Celsius in average. So why are coral reefs important? Number one, it's one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world. They are sometimes known as the forest of the seas. Why? Because they provide habitat to a number of um, different types of species, such as sea urchins, different types of fishes, sea turtles, different types of invertebrates, uh, different types of rays. So coral reefs provide habitat to a lot of ecological and economical important um, species. So it has a lot of ecological value. They also provide coastal protection. In this image right here, this is a, an aerial image of the town of San Juan in Puerto Rico. And you can see this uh, white area right here is the waves um, breaking uh, far away from the shoreline. So if you get the chance to be in the tropics and you go to a beach and you see far away standing in the shoreline, you're gonna see that white, um, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, spuma, espuma. <laughs> you're gonna see those white bubbly uh, areas in the sea far away. And that's where the coral reef is. That's where the waves are breaking in with the coral reef, okay? So they provide protection to all this coastal infrastructure and they provide protection uh, because they, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, they provide protection to this coastal area. Okay, so another benefit of coral reefs which Fiorenza explains so beautifully throughout her presentation is that they provide food and income to fishermen and restaurants. So it's the coral reefs are really, really important for this income to fishermen. They also have economic value through tourism. They are a um, uh, super attraction for tourism. People come through all over the world just to see coral reefs and, and the organisms that live within the reef. So it has a lot of economic value. It has re a lot of cultural value for us islanders. Uh, we do a lot of recreation, just swimming in the reef and just looking and, and enjoying marine life. So it has a lot of cultural value and it, it also has medicinal value because a lot of researchers, a lot of uh, scientists who develop medicines obtain ingredients uh, or, or components from organisms that inhabit the coral reef. So it has a lot of medicinal value also. However, despite the fact that these structures, these ecosystems are so important, they, they have a lot of threats right now including climate change, high temperatures, diseases, eutrophication, overfishing, such as Fiorencia talk about, uh, ocean acidification, you name it. They have a lot of threats right now. So these threats become problems. All of these threats can be summarized as land dwelling sources, such as pollution, runoff, non-sustainable agriculture, greenhouse gases, um, physical threats such as hurricanes, extreme rains, temperature, high temperatures, uh, shifts in pH, which cause 
ocean acidification. And we also have biological threats, which include pathogens and diseases. So if all these threats continue on, uh, in continue on, we're gonna have the, the coral reefs that look like this. This is a healthy coral reefs. Uh, so if these threats continue on, this reef will change in the future from this healthy reef, which has different types of corals, fishes, and different types of organisms. This is a healthy reef with high functionality. It'll change to basically this, reefs that are dominated by algae and only small species uh, that are more resilient to these, um, to these threats will survive, okay? So what are the implications of coral reef loss? So if threats continue on, we will have less calcification, less accretion, less connectivity between coral reefs and, and other ecosystems, less protection, uh, of strong wave action. And so coastal erosion will increase, coastal infrastructure will be in danger, okay? So all of these ecosystem services that I mentioned before, will basically lose them, okay? So how does the Marine Environment Society which I'm gonna call Sam from, uh, from now on, develop solutions for coral reef conservation. Right now, we're developing solutions for coral, seagrass, fishes, and diseases. But I'm gonna focus the presentation on two of them. The first one is protecting and conserving endangered reef building coral species and rehabilitating depleted reefs through coral reef restoration. So basically, in Sam, we take corals such as Acropora cervicornis, which have high, um, a high reproducibility in terms of asexual reproduction, because this coral has a lot of branches and every one of these branches can become one new colony. So this species in particular is in danger. So what we do is we fragment these corals, such as you can see here, and then we put these corals in uh, coral nurseries, structures such as this ones, which we call Christmas trees, and we put them to grow. So they start like this, and then after months being in the nursery, you can see them like this. And then we have two options. We can um, transplant the whole coral to the reef, for it to continue to grow, or we can fragment these corals and continue on producing more and more coral. So we have a lot of these structures uh, in the Isla of Culebra in Puerto Rico. So right now we have around 200, uh, 200 or 250 more or less structures such as this ones where we have a lot of coral growing. We, we basically, when they, when they grow, we take the coral. Here in this video, we're gonna do a transplantation. So you can see we're collecting the coral that grew and then we're gonna, we're gonna transplant in the reef. This is a depleted reef that doesn't have a lot of coral right now. So what you're gonna see is that in the next, Second, <laughs> you're gonna see, this is the, the way we uh, transplant coral to the reef for them to grow. We just uh, fixate the coral with a nail and then we let it grow and we monitor their growth. So we do this a lot in, the, in some. There you can see how we transplanted around 200 corals to this depleted reef and just let them grow. And right now to this day, they're growing beautifully. So this is a way we uh, restore or rehabilitate depleted coral reefs. The second way that we contribute to uh, 
developing solutions for these problems that core risks are facing is by studying disease behavior and causes. This is uh, my focus right now in the organization and it's also part of my PhD dissertation. So as Natasha mentioned, there is a new disease called stony coral tissue loss disease, which you can see right here, where you can see this coral, this, this is live tissue cover. It has then a white band and this is dead a coral, this is exposed skeleton uh, a colonized by algae, starting to be colonized by algae. So this is a new emergent problem. And us scientists, us marine scientists, uh, have to face this type of problems, you know, that come up from nowhere. And so how can we deal with this? This disease has dispersed throughout the Caribbean. Um, but since 2014. In 2014 was the first sighting in Florida. Then in 2018, it was seen in Jamaica, Mexico, San Martin. 2019 is where we see the disease in Puerto Rico. And then by 2020, the disease was all over the Caribbean. So how is Sam managing the disease? So first of all, we need to monitor how the disease is spreading throughout the Caribbean. And for that, there's this site called Agra, uh, agra.org, where they have this um, stony coral tissue loss disease panel with all the information regarding the disease nowadays from the number of countries or territories that have the disease, the number of countries that have treatments for the disease, the number of countries monitoring and the number of countries educating the, the population about the disease. And you can see a map of where the disease have been seen, where it hasn't been seen, which species have been affected throughout the countries in the Caribbean. So we monitor continually, continually uh, how the disease is spreading throughout the Caribbean. And in some right now, we're doing a demographic study in urban and undisturbed reefs to evaluate this is behavior. So this study is carried in Vega Baja, Puerto Rico, and in, Cule in the island of Culebra, Puerto Rico. Vega Baja, Puerto Rico, we call it the urban reef because there's a lot of coastal development in this area. So that reef is exposed to a lot of different types of pollutants through runoff. And then the Culebra Island, they're more undisturbed reefs. Um, they, there's no coastal development, not too many people visit those reefs. So uh, what, we, what we're doing here is comparing water quality, how water quality influences this is behavior. So we monitor continuously reefs in these two sites, uh, monthly to be specific, and we've been monitoring for a year now. And what we basically do is we photograph our uh, corals that we have tagged in all these sites and just monitor how the disease is um, behaving. So here you can, you can see one coral that in this photo, it wasn't diseased. It, this, this was in January. Then in February, you can see how the disease uh, began to, to develop. And then in March, you can see how the coral is losing life tissue cover. So what we do is we, with this data, we're measuring disease prevalence, this is incidence rates, survival and mortality, survival and mortality rates, disease progression, which is the rate of tissue loss, we also uh, research virulence, the effect of water quality and possible vectors. Vectors such as um, this type of fishes, these butterfly fishes, which tend to uh, like eat in the area where the, the tissue is infected. So we monitor all of that. Another thing that we do is we treat corals with an experimental antibiotic treatment. Um, so we've been doing these two things in Puerto Rico, but our focus right now is the demographic study. Why? Because by understanding disease dynamics, we can develop informed management solutions. Solutions that will lead us to establish priorities where to treat corals, which corals to treat, which species are priority, what size is the priority. Uh, we can also um, regulate treatment dosages according to water quality. And we can also justify the need for funding. 
in this sense, um, throughout our study, we've, we've um, published in the newspaper the results of our uh, research so we can let the people know this is an emergency. So thanks to that, we got to, um, we got to meet with a senator uh, in the government, in the capital. So Sam recommends the government the declaration of a state of ecological emergency due to massive coral die-offs and justifies with data the need for funding to manage disease. Us three, myself and my colleagues, Edwin Hernandez and Samuel Suleiman, were the ones who recommended that state of ecological emergency, the need for that uh, state. So after we get this meeting and we present data to the government, they agree that the state of ecological emergency is necessary. And so it was recently declared. So this is the governor of Puerto Rico and this is Edwin Hernandez. So state of ecological emergency declared for the first time in the history of Puerto Rico. This has never been done before, thanks to Sam's recommendations. And the outcome of all of this was a million dollar assigned to disease uh, for the management of this disease. So this is basically uh, two ways of how the SAM, uh, how the Marine Environment Society is working towards solutions to all these problems that affect coral reef ecosystems. So for more information, you can go to our, our social media, Social Ambiente Marine in Facebook and Instagram. Here's my email if you have other questions. And this is the site where you can see information about all of the projects that are running right now in SAM. And well, then this is all I have to say for my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions once we do the breakout rooms. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Fabiola, for that wonderful presentation. I think, yeah, it's been, we're already seeing some comments in the chat as well. Um, and I think it's just really helpful for all of us to get a sense of, you know, the work that you're both doing and what it looks like to actually uh, think about these species that are underwater that we don't often hear about, that we don't often get to see or encounter in the same ways that both of you do. Um, so thank you for sharing about your incredible research. Um, I see Daniel saying he felt like he was on a scuba dive. I, I agree with that. Um, so we're going to go into those breakout rooms. And so just so everybody knows the format, uh, we are going to have two breakout rooms, uh, about 15 minutes each. And uh, as usual, you can send your questions in the chat. Um, Ella will be running one room and I'm gonna ask Gabby to run the Q&A in the other room. Um, is that okay, Gabby? Thank you. And, uh, and so, uh, they, they will call on you to ask your question directly uh, to Fabiola or, or Fiorenza. That way they get to hear your voice and we can, we can get through some of those questions together. So Tamia, are we ready to go into those breakouts? So grateful for you all. And thank you so much, Fabiola and Fiorenza for spending time with us in these groups. Um, really, really interesting conversations, a lot of rich uh, material, I think, for all of us moving forward. We're definitely going to carry these ideas, these solutions, and um, experiences of that, that you've both shared with the research that you've been doing. Um, we're going to carry those forward. And as we start to think about our own climate action projects, uh, I think we'll definitely be drawing on the wisdom that you've both shared with us in your, even in the breakout session. So thank you. And also everybody, thank you for asking really great, great questions. Um, I feel like every week it just keeps getting better and better. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much. I think the, really a great question and great discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Natasha and everyone. I'm really honored to be part of this course today. <laughs>
Well, it's been a- I just wanna add my, my little bit. We're extremely honored to have had both of you. And I think, um, and I'll speak for myself, that the ocean is something that I love and enjoy and live near, but I haven't ever thought about it the way you both do every day in your, in your journeys. And I think for this organization, the oceans haven't been the priority that they need to be. And you've both changed that outcome for us. So gratitude. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for that, Judy. Um, so I, I, I don't think we have time for key takeaways today, but we will have time on Saturday. Again, uh, Ethan Estes, an artist and a marine scientist, will be joining us to talk about his work uh, in you know, working with ocean science and research, but also through art. Um, he's an artist and a surfer, and uh, he spends time at the Monterey Bay Aquarium doing research. So um, we'll continue with this, uh, this scuba diving journey <laughs> that we've had. He'll, sh he'll also share how he uh, makes art from uh, materials that he finds in the ocean. So he's using trash recycled from the ocean to make really beautiful artworks and raise awareness about ocean conservation. Uh, so it will definitely tie into a lot of the discussions we've been having today about uh, ocean solutions. And he'll bring to the table, I think, a, a conversation about interdisciplinary approaches to solutions building. So how we can all use our very diverse skill sets in this course to approach solutions creatively, innovatively, um, and using our imaginations in ways that maybe we haven't before. So I'm really grateful to you, Fabiola and Fiorenza. Thank you so much. And I'll see everyone on Saturday. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.